Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. It's Tori and this evening I am joined by one of my friends here on BookTube. Very excited to chat epic fantasy with Joanna. Joanna, welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So for anybody who isn't familiar with Joanna's channel, please go down in the description box below and click the link to her YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed already, you should do that because she is one of the most insightful reviewers uh, that I know and love watching. So you guys should definitely check out her channel. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That's so kind of you. <laughs> yeah, uh, 100%. Um, I love getting into deep dives. And I this was a topic that I've been kind of percolating on for quite a while. And I saw you had a, chan a discussion about it in you, your Discord, and there was some things going around on Twitter. And I thought, you know, this is a conversation I feel like we should have a sit down chat about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was interesting because I think we both saw the same Twitter post mm -hmm. um, and that was saying, you know, I can't wait until publishers make epic fantasy trendy again, something along mm -hmm. those lines. And we both got to thinking, hey, this is something we, I've been thinking about. Yeah. And so it was a meeting of minds. And yeah, I did introduce that tweet into my Discord. And sure enough, there was a lot of conversation there. Yeah, so. this is a big conversation. And I think that's one of the disclaimers we kind of wanted to make at the beginning of this is we're coming at this. And I'm not going to speak for Joanna, Joanna, but I'm coming at this definitely from a lover of epic fantasy, a reader of epic fantasy, and someone who is very invested in epic fantasy as a, you know, pillar and anchor of the genre. And I'm excited to chat a little bit about my thoughts on that. Joanna, I didn't want to speak for you. So feel free to add oh, you. No. I, epic <laughs> fantasy is my favorite genre. Um, and I'm just very curious about it. I've become more and more curious about it as I've gone on. And yeah, I think this is going to be a great conversation. I do too. And for anybody in the chat, feel free to make your own comments. Um, we are going to kind of share our definitions of epic fantasy to start with, just so everybody knows kind of where we're coming from. But I know that those definitions probably are going to differ a little bit for everybody. So um, feel free to share yours in the chat when we get going. Um, so Derry, to <laughs> soothe you a little bit, yes, we are going to be starting with some definitions. Um, but hello to everybody in the chat. Capricious Fox says, I'll be curious to know if I'm the only one that has noticed big space opera series seem to have ep replaced epic fantasy a little. So Joanna, that's a thing that we're going to talk about later. <laughs> yeah, Joanna we actually, said something very similar. Yes, yes. <laughs> we had a pre preliminary discussion about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is one of the first live stream discussions where I've actually had like a pre- live stream discussion and we talked for probably an hour hour and a half about this um there's there's a lot so we're gonna try and cover as much as we can tim's got his tea and his pastry excellent hi laura hey laura philip hey, is joining us hey kale hello, kale wow hi daniel mitch hello everybody casey jared shad mike whoops i missed mike there we go Another mic. Hello, everybody. Chris Navo. Okay. Hello, everybody. So we're going to get started with our personal definitions of epic fantasy. Both Joanna and I have been doing a lot of percolating on this, and, and Joanna's probably been doing a bit more uh, digging <laughs> into that than I have because she's okay. better about that. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I kind of sit when I sit down and think about what epic fantasy is to me personally as a reader it really boils down to a fantasy story that is epic in terms of the setting and the conflict and the themes that are explored in it so you can still have a very intimate immersion with the characters in that story but usually the characters feel very small in the world at large and there's this feeling of of it kind of being timeless or it's the story of like a people or a time period as opposed to you know one person's journey in a small sphere of life so that's kind of my nutshell version of my definition of epic fantasy that's very well said. Yeah, I, I mostly got into this topic when I did a review of the Long Price Quartet. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing that review, I think the challenge I was having is that 
I read this book and in one sense, I could totally get behind people calling that epic fantasy, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I think that any of the, the definitions that we come up with in this video, there's going to be a gray line. There's going to be sure. a spectrum. There are going to, you know, no, no book or series is going to follow all the conventions of that genre. Mm -hmm. But at, at the same time, I got curious about Long Price Quartet because while it takes place over a long period of time, it's a very long, big uh, story in a sense. It felt to me very zoomed in on these mm -hmm. intimate character explorations, even though there was a battle, there was a war between two nations and there were a lot of people affected in the story to me because it just felt so intimate. It felt so zoomed mm -hmm. in. There was part of me that hesitated to say this is epic or it made me question, is this epic fantasy? Yeah. And would people have the wrong expectation if they picked up that quartet and they were used to thinking of epic fantasy like well, as in Book of the Fallen or A Song right. of Ice and Fire, something along those lines where it's multi-POV, where we're dealing with a lot, uh, a less contained setting, I would say, a more mm -hmm. sprawling world. So I don't know. I, and so I went ahead and explored this question in that video. And when I was exploring the question, I came across Jay from Captured in Words who did a fantastic fantasy subgenre video. And he made a distinction between high fantasy and epic fantasy. Everyone, I highly recommend watching Captured in Words video, by the way, on this topic, because it was really interesting. But he said that he thinks of high fantasy as being in a secondary world, maybe with its own flora and fauna, its own magic, very highly magical. And usually a quest journey is happening, but it's very zoomed in on the characters and maybe explores themes such as courage and bravery. Mm -hmm those types of intimate heroes quest type of themes. Whereas with epic fantasy, epic fantasy is high fantasy, except epic fantasy has to, in his opinion, be multi POV. It cannot be single POV. Interesting. In his, in his definition, I believe he says that. And yeah. he said that he thinks that as a result, it's a more sprawling world and that your, your themes are not going to be contained to just a character maybe they sure. maybe those themes could be there but that you also in addition have themes that are much more global much right. broader so maybe themes such as colonialism for example or do the ends justify the means these right. larger moral questions for humanity and so that's where i also took some ideas of this definition of epic but i also explored a video talking about the definition of the word epic and where that yeah. comes from and what I found in one video is that the word epic comes from the word apos. I hope I'm saying that right. Somebody can, Alan can correct <laughs> me at some point, but apos or epos. And that this word means song, narrative, or word. And mm. it basically that the first epics, what we think of as the Iliad or the Odyssey, those were orally passed down. They had to do with heroes, with important people, mm. and that they usually involved invoked deities magic and I guess supernatural forces um, mm -hmm. in a sense, and that they also explored the most important questions to a culture. So mm -hmm. these broad themes once again, and sometimes they were over like they involved travel. Sometimes they involved mm -hmm. a long journey like the Odyssey, for example, but more important were the themes. And so, so yeah, I think I would say something along those lines as well. And am I being maybe a little, pedantic by deciphering between high fantasy and epic fantasy maybe i i don't fault anybody for calling like i said long price quartet high epic fantasy high fantasy but i guess just i guess when i think of the word epic i think it serves a pur purpose when we're talking yeah. about these these type of series that that were uh that tori and i tend to gravitate towards yeah, and I like, you know, when you bring up the the older epics in our own history of, you know, the Iliad, the Odyssey, um, there, to me, we have these, we still have those larger than life heroes that come out of those epics, but it's still, when I think of it, to me, it represents the story of nations and a time in history. And I think that would translate for me, at least, to epic fantasy series as well, where you have these particular characters that kind of rise to the forefront of as the, the almost representations of that time period. And I think that's part of why we get these mythological characters who at one point in their lives were just flesh and blood people, but history remembers them as these like immortal beings 
beings almost. And I think that that kind of ties back to the idea of them being representative of a whole as opposed to just an individual. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense to me. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I want to, there was a, oh, Evie had a epic fantasy for me is just broad scope with emphasis on the world building and or magic where the characters in action are vehicles to show the world building or magic rather than the opposite. All right. I, I definitely think the emphasis on world building or the world as a whole is much higher in epic fantasy because usually you're showing more of it, yeah. um, in an epic. Yeah. It's interesting because I just recently read The Dying Earth by Jack Vance, which was mm -hmm. written in 1950. I I wouldn't necessarily call that epic fantasy, but I would say mm -hmm. that that it was largely largely exploring this dying world in the distant future. It had some sci fantasy elements, honestly, and it mm -hmm. and the characters to me felt like they were vehicles for for showcasing the world, for showcasing the magic. Right. Um, Chibi Poe had a really good point here. I feel like a great deal of stuff that calls itself epic fantasy isn't. It's long form storytelling, but the epic is kind of small when you really look at it in terms of scale. That is something that I don't know if you've noticed this, Joanna, but a lot of, I do feel like epic has become a much more gray word in fantasy now in terms of um, books being marketed as epic that I end up reading with the expectation of, of epic fantasy and end up feeling more like it's it's more of an intimate view of a small group of characters and it isn't as much of a like exploration of a time in history or like we were talking about before. And I think that's really interesting because I'm having a harder time finding books that I read and I think, wow, yep, this definitely feels very epic in in terms of of the tone and the and the scale of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering about that too because uh in full honesty, I haven't I haven't been keeping up with a lot of the new things that have been coming out. I just checked out from well, anyway, I I guess I'll just say I for example, I haven't read what were the ones we talked about? The Will of the Many. I haven't mm -hmm. read that. Mm -hmm. I haven't mm -hmm. read The Book That Wouldn't Burn by Mark Lawrence. I, I haven't read that. The Tchaikovsky <laughs> series, I keep forgetting the name of that every that's very popular right now. So some of these newer the Shadows of the Apt, not Shadows of the Apt, but um, the House is something. I want to say it's something. Oh yeah, House. Uh, House of Last Chances. Maybe that's what it's City called. City of Last yeah. Chances. City of, City somebody of in Last the comments, Chances. Yes. There we go. Somebody in the comments correct us if we're wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't read those stories, and so I don't know. I don't know exactly what they're doing or how they're doing things. And mm. so, so it's hard for me to know, like, what is modern fantasy doing? And maybe mm -hmm. epic fantasy looks different now in the modern age yeah. than it did 10, 20 years ago. I mean, that's possible. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. That's where I have yeah. a lot of question marks. Yeah. I think in, in some ways we're concerned with the gray now more than I, I think a lot of the not all, of course, but some of the the older fantasy that I've read has more of a, a black and white feel to it. Um, hmm. And I, think I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> based on the ones that I've read, I've felt like there's there's definitely some like if you're looking at your your like traditional at least the fantasy that I grew up with, there was more of a like the struggle between good and evil, you know that kind of oh, thing, yeah. which I think mm -hmm. we still deal with, but in a much more gray kind of spectrum, maybe. Um, and I definitely think, obviously, we have one of them in the chat now, people uh, who've been writing fantasy for a very long time who have been concerned with that all along. Um, but hello, Janny. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Janny says that moment that bridges a foundational change where society breaks down its beliefs and redefines itself and the struggle challenges of seeing the old breakdown and the refounding of new order. Oh, that's a fantastic, fantastic yeah. definition. And see, that speaks to the larger societal themes that maybe mm -hmm. that society is going through this huge sort of cataclysm or mm -hmm. <laughs> new way of being new rebirth. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. I, I think that's pretty powerful. Um, you go ahead. Um, if you, I would oh, no. want to interrupt you. Yeah, here. no, I, all I was going to say is, yeah, I have a hard time. I, I guess, cause I, I don't know. I, I used to think the same thing too, though, because I think, I think it's easy to look at, 
Lord, of, I, I know a lot of people look at Lord of the Rings and they say, well, the quest for good and evil, though, of course, there's a lot of moral ambiguity in the Lord of the Rings itself. But at the same time, looking at a lot of, I know that there is some classic fantasy that falls mm -hmm. under certain conventions. Yeah. But at the same time, like reading Jack Vance, for example, and I don't know, I, I read a tiny bit of Zelazny, though it was more sci fantasy. I, I guess I just saw a lot more blending of yeah. weird things back yeah. in the 60s and 70s that I don't think gets talked about a lot now. And a lot of the fantasy I hear about, even when I watch people's videos, I'm like, wow, they did. A, there was a lot of blendy, weird stuff that happened mm -hmm. <laughs> that I don't mm -hmm. think we acknowledge because maybe I don't know why. Um, because I think we, when we think of fantasy, we think of the Belgariad or we think mm -hmm. of, like I said, Lord of the Rings or Wheel of Time, but I think, and even Wheel of Time, I'm not sure about, but I just, mm -hmm. I think there were some weird blendings and, and genre melding things that happened in the genre that that's been occur occurring for a long time, but maybe we just, those books weren't getting as much attention. I'm not sure. Right. Yeah. Well, and again, like we're going to talk about in a little bit, there's definitely a series of of market trends that tend to drive oh, yeah. a lot of the you know stories that are more largely available and i think you know we're, we've seen that all throughout publishing and certainly nothing new um in modern fantasy um philip had a question that i wanted to make sure we reached for and also like we're definitely not trying to say that we have the definition of epic fantasy but this is just like personal definitions at this point, but Philip had a good point. I often see people defining epic fantasy by its large scale, but a definition based on scale is going to be blurry. Just how big does it need to be to, to be to qualify as epic? Yes. And I think and that's a good point. Stephen Donaldson talked about this in his essays that a lot of times people say epic and they think it has to be long. It has to be mm -hmm. big. And I think he argued in his essays that that it doesn't necessarily have to be long or big, that that's not necessarily what Epic is about, but it is mm -hmm. about, I would say, I think he was saying that it was about the human condition also, that it was about these bigger, yeah. important, really big, important questions for humanity. Mm -hmm. As a whole, as opposed to like a, a smaller group or a, a singular character. So just as an example, I could say that I would I would definitely classify, for example, Philip's trilogy, which I'm mm -hmm. reading the third book right now, uh, the Edan trilogy. I would certainly I would certainly qualify that as epic fantasy because I know that one of the bigger things that is being explored there is about humanity and whether humanity is worth saving or not, mm -hmm. whether we're redeemable. Um, I'm just keeping it vague there. I think that's safe to say, spoiler free, right, yeah, Philip? Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but I think that that you know that speaks to those deeper questions. Yeah, and it's well, a more it's oh, a ahead. more timeless theme too. Like we can read, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey and find themes of humanity that are applicable now in in our you know modern time. And so I think a lot of the the big epics tend to be a little bit more timeless because they're dealing with questions that apply to humankind as a whole, as opposed to a singular moment or character. Um, I That's also true. kind of going along with that, I had written down a list because I think epic fantasy still has a huge spectrum of, of how you can utilize it and, and kind of going along with Phillips comment, you know, I read uh, The Fall by Ryan Cahill, which is a novella that goes along with his Bound in the Broken series. And it's, I think, 80 to 90 pages. And it's this massive epic scale battle for 80 pages. And it's multiple races. And it's, you know, there's some very heavy hitting themes. And it's 80 pages long. And I still would consider that very epic, despite being in a very short amount of page length. And then you have something like We Are the Dead by Mike Shackle, which is this massive, like, you know, war and invasion story uh, between multiple countries. And it only spans, I think, seven or eight days in the entire first book. Um, and then you move forward to something like, you know, the more modern Greenbone saga, which takes place over an entire lifetime of these characters and Malazan, which is its own thing and hundreds of thousands of years of history. And so I think there's a huge spectrum of how you can utilize that kind of epic scale. Um, and it's not just like, pe like you said, people sometimes want to box that into it has to be a really long book or really long series. 
Yeah. Philip likes the Donaldson's assertion about epic fantasy. It's literature of reintegration. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So uh, just to, uh, to explain that point a little bit, in one of Donaldson's essays on epic fantasy, he talks about using a secondary world to, to sort of explore these, these themes, to grapple with these challenging ideas, with these difficult situations. And in that way, we can in reintegrate when we mm -hmm. come back from story, what we've processed in story in that secondary world, that it allows us that option to do that in a way that's very unique to fantasy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Beth. Um, going through, if we're kind of moving from, from definition, because I honestly feel like we could have a live stream for three hours just discussing the definition of epic fantasy. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we mentioned in our pre-live stream chat was um, kind of shifting into the more modern approach to epic fantasy and the um, response to it in the, the more generic market. Do we feel like the attention span for epic fantasy series has become less in a wider market? That's a really good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I think so. Uh, I mean, it, 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 again, it's it's challenging when we talk about epic. Like I said, like because you brought up some good examples. You brought up a good example about how epic can be achieved in a shorter page length. Right. as far as exploring those things. But for the most part, mo nine times out of 10 to explore these broader themes, I think it does yes. take a certain amount of page count. Right. It takes a certain amount of development and trust in the reader and mm -hmm. author trust, I mean, author trust in the reader and then reader trust in the author to right. set things up, to develop things like doing what Jenny Wirtz is doing in Words of Light and Shadow. It takes some time and investment. Like you, ha you have to develop things. And I don't yeah. think... Um, I, I do think that some, sometimes that that's hard to see why, how, why something's important in a story when you don't have the whole end point in mind. And you right. might be like thinking, why are these characters interacting in this part when there are things going on over here? Or why are we focused here rather than there? And I, again, I just think that that takes time and, and some of these books are longer in length as a result of that. So I think sometimes people get a little bit impatient with this. Mm -hmm. I think I don't remember if I had this conversation with Jimmy or if I imagined this conversation I, or, or if I had it with somebody else. But we were talking, I know I was talking with, I believe it was Jimmy, with, about A Song of Ice and Fire mm -hmm. and about when A Storm of Swords, which is book three, is widely popular. No spoilers for why, but yeah, yep. if you think about all the work that went into the setup of that in books one and two and mm. how differently those books read when you know where the story is going right. versus if you don't know where it's going in book three and you're just reading books one and two, you're going to wonder, well, what's the payoff? What's the point? You know, and, and the same things with books four and five, which I understand from it's, it's weird because I guess at the time they came out, they were still really popular nowadays sure. on booktube and in a very small circle i hear people complain about those the pacing in those books and the thing is we don't know what it's setting up and where it's going and right. i personally love those books but i can understand why not knowing where things are going you might not understand the context and the reason for developing these things one step at a time but right. i also think that when it com comes to those types of bigger, longer, broader series, I think, and I, I could be wrong about this. I don't know because I feel like I'm in the wrong generation of readers here, but I want to say that when people were reading those series, like when they were reading Real, Real of Time, when the books were coming out, for example, they were reading to live in a fantasy world. They right. weren't reading to get through their TBRs as quickly as possible. Right. Whereas I do feel like people get very impatient and especially, and that's something that that's, I guess, one reason I've been a little resistant to DNFing is I always mm -hmm. want to give authors a chance. And I yeah. always want to, because I understand that 
it takes patience and it takes time. And if I were an epic fantasy author, I think I would feel scared of modern audiences wanting to yeah. DNF my book before I even really got going. So right. that's a long answer to your question, but you're no, not right. at all. <laughs> I, I think it's, I think that's a lot of really good points because, because when we see this even outside of, of reading, you know, we have such a kind of tendency now as a society towards that kind of instant gratification. And that's definitely true in entertainment. Um, I saw a post on Twitter a while back about somebody who had DNF'd the Shogun uh, series the new TV sh series, um, because it was too complicated for them to have it running in the background while they were doing other things. <laughs> and I was like, you know, and, and I do think that, you know, sometimes, and certainly it, it's hard too, because we live in this kind of booktube bubble where we're all like super nerds about fantasy, right? So for yeah. us, it's going to look a little bit different than it does for a wider reading market. Um, but I think that instant gratification is definitely something that I mean, as an author myself, I, I am aware of, I'm aware of the fact that there are going to be people who want me to give them everything in book one, you know, because they want to know exactly what's going on and they don't want to have to really settle in and just like immerse into the world and let it sweep them away from the day. And, and that's what I look for in fantasy reads. Um, but I think that instant gratification that we've kind of leaned into is really hard for series like that because, you know, sometimes, the, and, but the thing is, if, if you're willing to commit to that kind of an immersion experience, the payoffs are so great. They're so, there's nothing better than getting to the end of a multiple book series and you know these characters like they're your friends and the big, you know, climax of the series or they're, you know, you feel the emotions with them. That's such a beautiful experience that I think not enough people really either experience at all or like value in reading. And I think that's one of the reasons why epic fantasy is so important in a culture like that, because it teaches us patience and it teaches us to really immerse with what and really invest in what we are reading or ingesting, um, whether for entertainment or for whatever other purpose we're, we're reading for. That's um, beautifully said. How, how is that? I'm curious about how that affects you as a fantasy writer. Do you mm -hmm. try, especially as someone who just debuted your first epic fantasy, um, yeah. yeah, the first installment of your epic fantasy series, do you find, do you find pressure based on that? Or like, what does that process, what has that process been like for you as a writer? Yes and no. I think I've kind of compartmentalized the business aspect of writing from the act of storytelling because in terms of, of just being a storyteller, I don't feel pressure because all I can do is tell the story that I know I need to tell and whatever that's going to look like. And it's going to really land well for some people and some people aren't going to love it. And you know that going into any kind of story, um, whenever you publish whatever genre, you know, you know that it's not going to work for everybody and that's fine. Um, but from, from a business and marketing stand, standpoint, yeah, I think that's where the pressure starts to come in because, you know, if uh, you're trying to make some kind of a career out of writing, then there's this constant, I've never been a follow the trends type of person, um, but, you know, it, it is, it can be disheartening, I think, as, as somebody who want, who's hoping that their readers give them that trust and, and that, you know, I'm buying in for the big payoffs at the end of the series. And um, it can be a little disheartening, I think, when people are just like, well, nothing happened or, you know, whatever yeah. in, in your book. And you're like, what did you did you read it? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think there's definitely some of that. But at the end of the day, I think you have to be true to who you are as an author and you know your story better than anybody. And you have to tell it the way it needs to be told, because. Otherwise, you're going to regret it in the end, I think. Yeah. So. I love that you're so true to that. That's so important, I think, as a writer. And I, I, try. I know for me, I know for me as a as somebody who listens to reviews, nothing drives me more crazy than when somebody calls a book a slog or slow pace, but mm. they don't explain why. I'm why? not saying it's yeah. wrong to do that or 
to feel that way about a book, but I just want to know, okay, so what did the, what did we focus on? Right. <laughs> it was right. uh, that this engaged you. What was it specifically? And right. I understand the, I guess the fear of spoilers, but chances are, if you thought that it wasn't quote unquote important and nothing happened, then what was it that it, obviously it wouldn't be a spoiler, right? So <laughs> I guess yeah. I always want people to unpack that because sometimes the, the right. moments I enjoy the most in books are ones that other people would consider slower paced or yeah boring. <laughs> well, and I, I think that kind of for me that boils down as an author to those moments where you're not in the middle of the action but you're taking a moment to understand something about either the either the world or the characters that you're with and we're just kind of taking a moment to rest or to engage with them on a deeper level before all of the stuff hits the fan, you know, like it's um and those are some of the most important moments I think in writing because then when the action and the big moments come they mean something they mean more because you've had those moments at rest with those characters yes absolutely true yes I you guys in the chat have just been having an amazing conversation over here that I want to make sure I'm not totally missing I have to say I haven't been able to keep up with what everyone has said in the chat but there's part of me that just feels like my heart is just glowing right now because all these people are so passionate about epic fantasy I know, I and I'm like, these are my people. <laughs> these are, you know, these are my people. So yeah. Derry, this is a great point. I wonder too, if epic fantasy is a set of goalposts constantly shifting in relation to language usage and marketing spin. I think there's definitely something to that. I mean, I even look at, you know, this is one that I always get razzed for um, amongst my peers on booktube, but as a big Red Rising fan, and I'm not calling Red Rising epic fantasy, by the way, in case anybody's concerned, but <laughs> um, <laughs> the idea that on the first book, when it came out, it was referencing Hunger Games. And now everyone is like, oh, it's basically the Hunger Games, right? And so that that was a distinct choice by the marketing team of Red Rising to try to catch a whole subset of readers that they knew were really obsessed with the Hunger Games, despite the fact that Red Rising is a much older <laughs> demographic of reader book and just not the same story. There, There is some of that, I think. And I mean, we've seen that in epic fantasy where every book that came out for like 10 years was the next Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> if, if it's epic fantasy, it's Game of Thrones. There's no difference, <laughs> like, you know, as in terms of marketing. Not even that. I, I remember one time I was on Instagram and I saw some sort of post and it had an ember in the ashes, which is a YA series yeah. that is all like, there was nothing, it has nothing in common with the Song of Ice and Fire, okay? And they were saying, if you like a Song of Ice and Fire, read an ember in the ashes. I'm like, what? <laughs> right, right. Because it's more about catching a demographic than it is about actually giving a comparable, like, yeah. yeah. Yep. That always drives me. We're not even going to get into book blurbs because no, that's yeah, a no. conversation. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Daniel says, there are times it can be done in fewer pages. Such examples remain exceptions to the I would agree with that. Yeah. Purple Dragonfly. I've been reading fantasy for 30 years. That's, I can't wait to get to that point. And back then, there wasn't really that much epic fantasy. It was kind of niche. I feel like there's a wider variety of fantasy readers now. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I can believe that. Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's interesting because like epic fantasy, like, yeah, even just thinking about, like I said, the Jack Vance book I read. And if you think about Elric, those stories were published in magazines. So yeah. there were smaller installments yep. um, of Robert E. Howard's Conan series. I mean, there was a lot of fantasy that wasn't necessarily epic fantasy per se, but still fantasy and still capturing the fantasy reader audience. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just interesting to look at that genre specific genre, uh, genre and what it was like for people who've read for a long time. Right. Well, and, you know, you mentioned uh, kind of the the hustle through the TBR a little bit mm -hmm. ago. And this, I mean, this goes into the discussion that I think we see on BookTube all the time, which is how does being part of a reading community like BookTube change the way you approach books. And I know it has for me oh, yeah. um, in, in a lot of really good ways. And in some ways, I feel like I am less inclined to commit to a, a bigger series because 
that's like the only thing I'll be able to talk about for two months or three months then. And that's not how I want to approach it. So I'm working on that. But I definitely think that it changes our willingness to commit to something of that scale. Yeah, I think it certainly could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tim yeah. says they should just say, if you like similar titles with nothing in common. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I'm already planning my six hour video Tori is wrong about, I think it's, it's sci fantasy hundred percent, but it's not, it, that's definitely not fantasy, but I, I would love to see that video, Daniel, please make it. Cause I will watch it the whole six hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I mean, I guess I can see more distinctions now, but there was actually for a long time, I always had a hard time. I guess, I don't know. Like I could see a lot of blurring. When it, came, sure. when it came to sci fantasy specifically, like whether you call it fantasy or science fiction, mm -hmm. I, I can get behind Red, Red Rising being sci fi. That's usually what I call it, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love this is something that Janie's brought up a couple of times uh, in conversation with me on the channel that I absolutely 100% agree with. And I think it's a learned skill, honestly, is when you mm -hmm. go into a book or a series, dropping your expectations from anything else you've read, from anything else, like, and just allowing it to take up its own space and be its own piece of art. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I totally agree with you, Janie, on that. Absolutely agree. I feel like Malaz and Book of the Fallen taught me that more than any other series because it yep. just did so many things differently than I'd ever read before, especially coming off reading a lot of Sanderson. It was just so different. And the way that it played with structure in such a unique way, storytelling in such a different way, that it made me open-minded to different forms of storytelling or different ways of approaching narrative. And yeah. so that I, I really appreciate that. I would say that these days I do tend to, I still tend to prefer character focused stories the Same. most. But I can actually enjoy a story that's not character focused is what I've learned too, or yeah. even plot focused. Um, I just, I think it's neat to be able to appreciate different kinds of storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. Brian says the hustle through the TBR 100% has affected up series. I'm dying to read the Wars of Light and Shadow, but can't mix content with Malazan in my yeah. brain. That would be a big ask to do both at the same time, Brian. So I can understand that. I don't blame you. Yeah. Yeah. That's any, the reason. Any two big series at the same time would be a lot. Oh yeah. It's the reason that I, everyone keeps asking me, when are you getting the live shift Raiders? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm in the middle of the wars of light and shadow right now. <laughs> so yep. everything else is going to have to slow down for a while and that's fine, you know, mm -hmm. but it yep. does make it, make you have to miss out for a while. And I think that's okay. You know, I everything, think that's okay too. there'll be, there'll be time for everything. Well, you're, you're defying that tendency to not commit to the series you're in like I can't I can't even count how many first books of a series I have started oh yeah and no, I, I want I, don't like doing I can't that. no I I'm getting to like it less and less the more <laughs> I have under my belt Derry says I think it's become more common to have expectations for new books with so much information at our fingertips we've become used to the idea of what something is before having access to it the reviews, the booktubers talking about it, the live stream discussions, the wrap ups, the Twitter discussion. Like there's so many places that we have been told everybody else's expectations or experiences with a book long before we get to it. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that's helpful. And sometimes I don't know if that is helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um. One of the things that we I had on my list to talk a little bit about was indie versus trad publishing and publishing in terms of epic fantasy, um, because it seems like in traditional publishing, that's definitely not the market trend at the moment. Um, and so I know that it is harder for authors to um, get bites on something that isn't a standalone or maybe can get into, you know, a trilogy at most. Yes. And I, I, I was going to speak to that, the, the publishing and just a little bit. Yeah. I, I was curious about this topic as well, because like I said, I still don't know a hundred percent about a series like the will of the many, that series or the Tchaikovsky one that we talked about, or 
about the book that wouldn't burn. Some of the more popular ones have been talked about recently. I don't really know where they fall in that genre mix, but uh, whenever I watch a new release video, I've been trying to keep up with some new release videos this year. And I did notice a couple on Patrick Leo's last video, uh, his, in, his fantasy spotlight video. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I think most of them were self-published, mm -hmm. but for the most part, whenever I watch a recent or anticipated reads new releases video, I rarely hear about a new epic fantasy series. I, at least the last couple of years, again, question mark for the three I already mentioned, but right. I rarely hear about that. I do hear a lot. Of course, there's a lot of buzz about Dandelion Dynasty still, which recently wrapped up. I know yep. Durfee's trilogy is very popular, though mm -hmm. that came out a few years ago now, or at least the last mm -hmm. book, at least last year or two years ago. I think but so, I mean, yeah. just within the last couple of years, I haven't really seen new epic fantasy authors coming on the scene, at least to my knowledge, but I have seen them in the self-published world. Right. So, and yeah. I think that's partially because as indie authors, we're not uh, beholden to the market trends as much. Um, mm -hmm. Not that we don't pay attention to them um, and sometimes write for them, but we have, I think, more freedom to delve into like we kind of are our own boss in that way. So we can just say, well, I feel like writing an epic fantasy series, so I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and there are, you know, like anything pros and cons to that. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think it's it's the snappier like standalone or short trilogies are very marketable to the general public as opposed to the big you know dense fantasy or chonkier fantasy series not dense in terms of how they're executed but just you know their commitment mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. yeah yeah beth says she's very right about that thinking about upcoming fantasy series yeah yeah and I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of an outlier um, in that sense with and, and why I'm in the indie sphere is because I've been dreaming about writing an epic fantasy series for 15 years. So like that's never changed. I don't care what the market is. That's where I'm at. And that's what I love to write. So that's what we're doing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I hope you don't mind me bringing this up because we talked about it in our preliminary discussion. But you brought up such a really interesting point about some of the broader, more global themes that are brought up in epic yeah. fantasy and whether some of those themes, why they might not be resonating with mm. the audiences right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, thoughts on that? Yeah. So one of the things I'm jumping down on my notes here a little bit, um, I think there tends to be trends in terms of what type of tone of books I think people search for at any given time as we see different historical events unfold and we go through different, you know, eras um, of experience. And I think, you know, we're seeing, uh, and I don't want to speak on this too much because I know he has, uh, he wants to kind of talk more about it on his channel and stuff, but my friend Andrew Meredith, who's also an epic fantasy author, talks a lot about the cycle of of tones of story and you know grimdark had a really big boom around the covid <laughs> kind of scene which isn't really shocking um and then as we're kind of coming out of that we're kind of moving on to like more tones of story that are I think more what people are, are searching for now not that grimdark is going anywhere but that there's kind of a new you know, burst of of interest in something that is more like noble dark, where it's kind of something that's that's a little bit further on the scale to that. Um, and I think part of that is, you know, we I've I've been seeing a lot about cause and compassion fatigue, um, and I think everybody I know, just in my own sphere, there's this kind of exhaustion of this kind of political and moral exhaustion <laughs> that I see everywhere. Um, and, and it's this idea of like, I just want to get out of the present. I want to go to a different world. And this kind of ties in with your idea of, of sci fantasy kind of having a, a boom. Um, get me into the past, get me into a secondary world, get me into the future, anywhere but this present moment, because it's exhausting to be here. Um, and I think that that's kind of where you were intending for that to go with, it was that discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, you also had some really good thoughts on that, that I want to let you 
segue sure. into. But. No, I just think that's so fascinating. I, I really do wonder about that. I really mm -hmm. wonder if that's the case. And it's interesting. It's like, uh, like we were talking about with the Stephen Donaldson essay, how he considers fantasy a way of of grappling with those heavier questions or issues. And yeah. yet maybe we've even reached a point possibly where we're too exhausted to <laughs> explore it in the secondary <laughs> world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that, yeah. And I think that's possible. I know some people sometimes, you know, as much as I love epic fantasy, I can't read epic fantasy all the time. I, can't I have to, yeah. I, I have to switch genres now and then I have to switch types of fantasy now and then I was just telling Tori right before going live that I just finished the Black Cauldron. I actually listened to this on audio, but it's the Prydain series, mm -hmm. which is a middle grade high fantasy series. Definitely not epic, <laughs> but it was really good. I was actually yeah. really impressed with this book. Um, but, but yeah, I think sometimes I need, I need a break from epic fantasy at times yeah. as much as I love it. And as much as I get pulled in when I read it. So mm -hmm. I, I do wonder though, um, yeah, I guess the question I had about that, we were talking about cozy fantasy having a day right now. Romantic seemed... cozy fantasy. And that would line up with that idea of people kind of looking for still that fantasy, but maybe a little bit less on the large morality questions <laughs> all yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I also even wonder if, yeah, so I wonder about that. And I also wonder in addition to that, romanticy obviously is having a day too. And I think there's mm -hmm. something kind of cozy about just an intimate story that's still fantasy uh, right. that can have, you know, a large appeal for obvious reasons, you know, and at the right. same time, you don't have to grapple with these heavy moral questions, I think, in a romanticy. I'm sure romanticy does explore that sometimes. I've under I understand that there is some of that in some mm -hmm. romanticy, but maybe not on the extent again as a right. like large scale epic fantasy. Um, so I think that I, as far as the sci-fi element is concerned, I, I guess where I was going with that, we have grimdark fantasy, but we also, I think grimdark has largely been a response to fantasy, almost being a little cozy at times, right. as, yeah. as yeah. Mark Hockta explains in Epic Pooh, he wanted, yep. he wanted, uh, fantasy to push a boundary a little bit more to, to go harder, yep. to go heavier in, yep. in a sense. How far can we take this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I wonder if in some ways, I, I was telling Tori, I had this thought the other day. Uh, so this is just kind of like a thought that passed through my head because I've been reading a lot of science fiction and I feel like science fiction deals with themes in a different way. A lot of people say, oh, science fiction deals with ideas. And I'm like, well, how right. is that different than themes? <laughs> but I think that the, the, the idea here is that whereas we might get an idea that's that's maybe romanticized a little bit in epic fantasy, like courage and truth and honor. And those are beautiful qualities. And they're things that still move me when I write, when I read epic fantasy, when we put it in, and I'm not saying that fantasy doesn't critique those things at times, but mm -hmm. a lot of times if we put these sort of themes in a sci-fi futuristic context, a lot of times I think it takes a little bit more of a cynical <laughs> yeah. perspective. Yeah. <laughs> I need to think of direct examples of this, but I always feel yeah. like there's a little bit of a cynical and like a little bit of a dark perspective on the future and technology and where it's going and what if questions, but looking at those what if questions in a slightly more critical lens through a slightly right. more critical lens. I don't know if I'm imagining that. So the blend between yeah. sci-fi and fantasy gets a, allows us to have those fun, epic quests maybe and journeys and at the same time and have this large scale thing happen, mm -hmm. but with that edge of realism, with that right. edginess to it that sci-fi can do, especially with the technology aspect and where we're going, uh, looking into the future. So I don't know. I, I That's just my thought. I'm yeah. not processed on that hundred percent. I think that's it makes a lot of thought. sense though, because it, it kind of, you know, you got two sides of the same coin where it's the, how did we get here and where are we going? Mm -hmm. How does this, you know, play out if these themes are, you know, continue to be, um, and, and Derry brings up a really good point again, too. Go back far enough and fantasy and science fiction didn't just share bookstore shelves. They shared pages within books. Yeah. They're far closer than pe people realize oh, now. I, I used totally to get, agree with that. I do, too. I used to get criticized for saying that I thought they were basically the same genre. 
Oh, I, I think there's room to I say think that. they are. Yeah. I think in a lot of ways, because, you know, sci-fi, it's still a speculative fiction world <laughs> yeah. that where the magic is technology that doesn't exist yet. Right. Like it's, it's still the same. A lot of this, the, the execution is often different, but the, the ideas that kind of birthed both of them, I think are very, very similar, if not pretty much the same. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So. No, I was having that thought. Cause like I said, reading the dying earth recently, there's flying cars or in a distant future and we have little twick men, little fairy men. <laughs> Yep. And then also like in the Elric saga, we have the multiverse. So I think we see a lot of sci fantasy elements in a lot of older sci-fi oh, and yeah. fantasy. They blended quite a bit. They blended well, quite I'm, a bit. I'm also reading a uh, forerunner by Andre Norton um, right now. And her uh, books are quite a bit shorter, um, but it's, it's a classic fantasy that in my mind, as I'm reading it, I, I found myself sitting there going, oh, this is sci-fi. Oh, this is fantasy. Oh, this is sci-fi. Oh, this is fantasy. Like, and so there's such a, 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 like Derry was saying, there's such a blend of the two that I almost just quit asking after a while. And I'm just like, this is a story that has fantasy and sci-fi in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's, that's fine. Like that, I, that blend is something that I obviously what Red Rising as one of my favorite series of all time. I do consider that sci fantasy. I know a lot of people will just say straight sci fi. I think it's sci fantasy um, because a lot of the themes and the just the feel of it feels very epic fantasy, but it's a sci fi. So, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really love that blend because I think it allows us to ask where did we come from and where are we going at the same time, um, which is very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I know that our friend okay. Matt from Matt on Books has made that argument quite a bit too, talking about mm -hmm. Dune as being slightly more fantasy or Star Wars. You can find fantasy elements in a lot of sci-fi or vice yep. versa. Mm -hmm. Yep. Kale says sci-fi tends to be explicitly sent in our reality or future. Sometimes, I think sometimes it also has to do, like they'll go out on planets that don't exist in our uh, solar system or that they've kind of created their own. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and you can have low fantasy too, where um, like the Dresden files is a good example of, of a series that takes place in our world, but it's obviously very fantasy. That's right. Harry Potter too. <laughs> it's a portal fantasy, but. Jenny word says Becky chambers and miles Cameron's artifact space are not cynical. There are exceptions in SF as in anywhere. Yeah. There's always going to be, um, exceptions to the the current t tone or the general tones. Yeah, and um, I mean, I, I probably should should be careful not to oversimplify with that too. Um, I think my thought immediately went to I don't know about Sun Eater, but I get the sense mm -hmm. that it is a dark story. I could be yeah, wrong, yeah. but I keep getting that sense. And then you know, when the, it's like kingdoms of death, ashes of man, you know, empire of silence, you do kind of get that vibe. Yes. <laughs> I wonder yeah. why. Yeah. And then the I other thing that came, came to mind too with that is um, Dune, the Dune, the, pop, mm -hmm. the resurgence of Dune and how that's mm -hmm. come into, you know, become popular because of the adaptations, the three body problem, that trilogy, Remembrance of Earth's Past, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. It also sounds pretty terrifying. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I feel like we're looking at some pretty terrifying aspects of humanity uh, in those particular series. I know Three Body Problem is specifically sci-fi, though. So I should right. be yeah, yeah. very clear about that. And Dune, I know most people would say that's sci-fi. But it's still, I still feel like those particular series, I know that Becky Chambers does a more wholesome view of things in, one of, in some mm -hmm. of her books. But, but yeah, I mean, the way that Dune looks at leadership... <laughs> Is a pretty. It has a pretty, pretty frightening look at at that aspect of humanity. I would say, and I think that that is speaking to people right now. I think there's a reason. In addition to the adaptation just being incredible, I mm -hmm. think that the themes are speaking to people right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what's so cool about fantasy and sci-fi in general is that timelessness of them allows them to have those resurgences where there will be times when certain series just speak to the larger experience in that particular time and they can come back over and over and over again. It's why so many of our own historical narratives do the same thing, where you see these resurgences of stories of historical figures past going through things that it's like, wow, 
humanity really is the same in a lot of ways uh, going in cycles of, of that experience. Um, and you kind of brought up too in our discussion about how in, in some ways, like some of the moral themes that often are explored in the fantasy series that we love so much is that the idea of the, the portraying ideals that we've lost or that we're trying to um, aspire to. Um, and I, I know you had some really great thoughts on that in our discussion. So I wanted to make sure I brought that up so you could share those. Oh, yeah. Again, yeah, sure. Really oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I was talking about this to Tori because I was reading Tigana by Guy Gabriel K, which I finished. And what I happened to notice when I was reading that book, I know Kay gets a lot of, I hear criticism of Kay's books from various people I know saying, why doesn't he just write historical fiction? Like why even go the <laughs> fantasy route? Because yeah. there's so little magic in his stories and the secondary worlds largely resemble our world at a certain period of history. Uh, but in Tigana, in my opinion, Tigana would not work if it were not fantasy, it has to be fantasy right. for them. It right. just has to. Uh, but at the same time, I was noticing some moments in the writing that just spoke to me personally that were about these truths about, about freedom and about these noble, this noble sense of honor and courage and thinking beyond yourself. This yeah. It was basically fantasy idealism, but mm -hmm. it, I realized that it just moved me. It spoke to my heart because Kay is such a gifted writer. Yeah. It, it just really, it really moved me. It really inspired me. And I realized as much as I love this and I associate this with fantasy, this feeling, it has nothing to do with magic. It, mm, it does seem yeah. to work because it is a secondary world, even though it's historical. Yeah. It does seem to work because it is a secondary world and maybe secondary world resembling our past so there is a romanticized, I guess, notion behind it. But right. if I put that, if I try to put that kind of feeling or write about that in a modern book, in a modern setting, I don't think, or if Kay did that, I should say, because he's the writer, he's the better writer. But if he did that, I just don't know <laughs> if it would be convincing. I think there's something right. about it being removed, kind of speaking to Donaldson's yeah. point, maybe. There's something yeah. about it being in a secondary world and in the past that and being fantasy that just makes that idealism come alive on the page. Yeah. Well, and it allows us to, I think, digest it in a less confrontational way too. There's that psychic barrier that's, that's so beautiful and, and wonderful about fantasy because it allows people to take a really hard, close look at these really heavy moral themes without immediately applying it. Like they have some space where they can think about it first and then kind of let it sit with them in their own personal life outside of the book. Um, and I'm kind of in, in the camp of, of I actually looking back at all of my favorite fantasy reads of all time, not one of them was for the magic system. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's just not like a magic system will not make or break a book for me unless it takes away from the characters. And that's because I'm, I'm just a, character very character driven uh reader so i like i like to see the magic system becoming almost a supporting character for the story itself but that it's it's boosting those characters and it's it's giving more um depth to them so, rather than taking the spotlight yeah and that's what i loved again about donaldson's essay he spoke to something about magic as metaphor and mm. that was also what i loved about the Long Price Quartet is I felt like mm -hmm. the magic without giving any spoilers for the Long Price Quartet, but yeah. there's this magic, the on dot, there are these spirit figures that the poets in the world, they, they create through their magic, through poetry magic, essentially, but mm -hmm. they represent a darker aspect of their psyche and, yes. and it makes them have to face these darker aspects of themselves. And I feel so like it good. was brilliant because it's like yeah. using magic to go deep into the psyche. So yeah, I love I, that. I will caveat my earlier statement with, um, I think that out of every book I've ever read in fantasy, that the Long Price Quartet's magic system was the one that blew me away the most by oh, far. Oh, really? Oh, wow. oh yeah, yeah, by far. Um, because that was one that I noticed and it yeah. really took a major player 
stands in the story, but that didn't bother me, which was kind of surprising for me because usually I'm like, okay, I don't want this to be about the magic. I want it to be about the characters. Um, and I feel like uh, Abraham really hit that balance in a absolutely perfect way. Yeah. Yeah. I really loved how complex that was. I, I agree with you though. I don't, I don't know. I'll have to think about that some more about my thoughts about magic in general and fantasy. We can have another discussion about magic. Yeah. <laughs> we might have to do that. We might have to yeah. do that. I'm going to give it some thought. And that's, that's, I mean, magic systems are, are such an integral part of fantasy. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. you know, such an important part of the genre. So I think having a really well done magic system is absolutely um, part of some of the best books that I've ever read. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying that it's not important by any means. Yeah, because a lot of times magic is sometimes, I, I think it's often a metaphor for power yeah. is how I would see it. And yep. I guess like some of my earliest memories of falling in love with fantasy are the Sword in the Stone by Disney, mm -hmm. that movie, and seeing the Wizard's Duel. Like the Wizard's Duel yep. was just it for me. <laughs> but I just remember like how, like how moved I was by Merlin being able to win that that duel with his magic, but he won it through his wit as well. Right. So it's, it's a, it's not just power, but it's also intelligence. And so I, yeah, I think that magic can serve a really powerful purpose in story, but it, it does take, I think a skilled writer to use it in a clever way to make it yeah. layered in that sense. Well, it allows the characters and the reader to tap into something so much larger than themselves. You know, if I think back on my favorite fantasy films growing up and, you know, watching, uh, Aslan breathe life back into the stone statues or watching, you know, Arwen command this huge horde of, uh, you know, this, this herd of horses coming down the river. And like, there's just something so, like you said, powerful about that. That's really, um, it's, it kind of gives you chills and stays with you, those images. And that's obviously in, in writing as well. But those, those two came to mind right away when you were talking about films, early fantasy films. Yeah fellow LPQ fanatic in the house. Mm -hmm. I love how the magic works in LPQ and how it accentuates the plot and stories of the characters. Absolutely. It really does. It really does. It's such a, it's such a cohesive story. Mm -hmm. Which I think um, would be the challenge, right? For writing epic oh, fantasy yeah. to develop this large scale world and all these characters and all these moving parts to make it all come together, to make it all work together. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> hard to do with just fantasy in general. Just fantasy oh, yeah. in general is hard. It's yeah. it's it's so much. And it's funny because I've had people not within the fantasy community, but people outside of it who have said that it must be so much easier uh, writing fantasy. And oh I'm like, God. No, because I have to make everything from pretty much scratch. <laughs> so, like, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, just put my characters in an, in an existing setting. I'm building something from from scratch, and that that is very. That's where the pressure comes in in writing for me. Is is does it make sense? And like, it's kind of that imposter syndrome of as soon as I put it out there, and people are going to be like, "Well, this doesn't make sense," because mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So there's a lot of there's a lot of threads to to pull together in those. Absolutely. It's because the misconception among those people, I think, is that magic is a stand in for plot armor, basically. Sure. But that's yeah. that's what the magic is for. So you could save your character with the dragon at the last minute and not mm -hmm. <laughs> and not skillfully weaving it into to character development, to story. I mean, there's so much to it. And, and you're right. Just building a whole secondary world. Goodness. Yeah, Absolutely. that's impressive to be able to do that. I'm sure. Uh, Corey Ratliff, fellow indie author, I like when magic systems become part of the problem or the challenge when it elevates the story and deepens the characters. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Um, Derry, equating magic to power is what make ho makes Hobbes addictive magic even more toxic. Oh, Derry, wow. you're a Hob fan, right? You're a Hob fan? <laughs> I love how she always has to have the hearts. <laughs> the hearts. I know, it's awesome. <laughs> Um, Janny, uh, nothing exposes human weakness and strengths than handing a character access to power of any kind. It magnifies morality and exposures so much. Absolutely. Yep. And that's, that's what I like to use it for. Cause I, I definitely think that, um, I want the magic to show you something about the character who's using it. I think that's a really important way <clears throat> of, of utilizing it, especially in fantasy. And one of the things that we talked a little bit about too, that we haven't really touched on yet, that kind of 
maybe speaks a little bit to some of the comments that were going on before about how fantasy isn't as niche now as it used to be, um, which I think is awesome. And we're all of us fantasy nerds are thrilled about that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, But I think also part of that expansion of fantasy in, in the modern reading age is also we're seeing this absolute explosion of subgenre. I mean, I can't keep up. There's a new one. It seems like every other day, I don't even know (laughs) all of them. Like I heard sandal punk for the first time a while back and I was like, what is that? (laughs) Like I can't keep up. Um, And I think that that's kind of a natural, like, you know, epic fantasy is now just kind of one of this giant pool of, of things to pick from, which is awesome because it means that there's something for everyone. Like whatever you feel like on that particular day, you're probably going to find it, which is great. Um, but I think a, a lot of these very new subgenres, understandably, have a lot of attention because they're new and exciting and they're the oh shiny of the day. Um, and Epic has just kind of been the steady, like he's just kind of been here for a while, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've noticed that as well. Like there seem to be so many subgenres Mm-hmm. I'm not really sure what that's about, honestly. <laughs> I'm really curious <laughs> about why that's the case, why there are so many different niche genres. And maybe it's just yeah. because reading has become more popular. I I would hope. I don't know if it is. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. If anybody I in the mean, chat has some insight into why there is such an explosion of subgenres, I would be so curious. I mean, I think we also live in an age where people really enjoy putting labels on things. So I think that, um, you know, books that would have been categorized as just fantasy in the past. Now people are like, well, let's, uh, you know, identify down into like smaller subgenres and be able to say specifically what niche genre of fantasy is this story, Mm -hmm. Um, which is also, it's helpful for marketing on some levels and on other levels it is kind of a con in my opinion, because it splits it up sometimes too much. Um. Cassidy, I think it's just a need to explain things more and being like, I like this. I want more of this. Yeah. Yeah. Which kind of goes back to our discussion about like, if you like Game of Thrones, you will also love Ember in the Ashes, (laughs) you know, like that kind of, well, yeah, they're both fantasy, but they're not the same, you know, they're not the same. That's true. That's true. And by the way, Cassidy's video, she did a wonderful recommendations video on Mm side fantasy. And that was also Mm -hmm. what got the wheels turning in my head too about I think this is really the next thing. Like, yeah, (laughs) of course, everything's the next thing because there's a lot of popular stuff going (laughs) on right now. (laughs) But I guess I just I do see sci fantasy or fantasy with more sci fi elements emerging. Not to say it hasn't always been there because it has. But at the same time, I do see that trending pretty hard right now. Yep. Derry says, I feel so old. I remember when fantasy was split onto into swords and sandals or swords and sorcery. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly what I think too, Zen. I think a lot of it's it's a lot of breaking down more because we saw that when YA fantasy split off and there's, you know, now there then there was YA paranormal and YA fantasy romance. And, the, and then that was just in the YA sphere. And I think, you know, it's been slowly kind of splitting apart um, since that when things started to move to other shelves <laughs> and, and then yeah. why stop there? And in some ways, I I can kind of understand it. So like, for Mm -hmm. example, if somebody enjoyed Twilight, they wouldn't necessarily say, hey, I think you'd really love Harry Potter. (laughs) Right. They're two very different. um, Yeah. So it's good to, in some ways, it's good to have some distinction so people know what they're looking for. I remember feeling that way whenever I read the Dark Tower series, when I picked Mm. up the first book in that series a while, a long while back. My brother just kept on raving about it, saying, oh, my goodness, this is the best. It's an amazing fantasy series. And he kept calling it fantasy. And then reading book one, The Gunslinger, it was just not your typical medieval fantasy that I was Mm -hmm. expecting. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that I didn't like it. I just it just wasn't what I was looking for. It didn't meet the expectations I had. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting how that can affect your experience. For sure. For sure. Um, yeah, there's some other comments in the chat about labels, labeling things. Um, but yeah, marketing is definitely a big part of it. Perhaps the indie boom sparked it, but there are many, I think that honestly, that probably could be a good point too, Corey, is that, um, 
in Indy and how Indy is starting to set some of the trends that we see come up in, in traditional publishing uh, slightly later. Um, I think because Indy, as a general rule, we like to break out of boxes. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, the indie community certainly has exploded in subgenres and everybody's constantly trying to blend new things and write new things and figure out how to like, you know, push the edges of the of the subgenres even further. And um, so I think that some of that's kind of starting to bleed into um, trad as well now. Do you find yourself wanting to find certain terms for your fantasy series so that it gets the right reader? Because I'm sure that's important yeah. for you, you as an author, too, because you want to attract sure. the right reader to your series. It is. It's it's a blessing and a curse in some ways, because um, Bloodstones isn't as good of an example of this as Phased is. So Phased is my YA paranormal. Mm -hmm. If I say to people, this is a YA paranormal, you think Twilight. Probably right? Twilight, yeah. Right. Um, and that's actually worked against me, that label, because people have a certain stereotype now that they expect from YA paranormal. They expect it to be a romance. They expect it to be very angsty. They expect it to be this level, like these kind of things. And phased pushes out of that. And it was kind of my rebuttal to that kind of because I grew up during the big twilight boom. And so I, you know, had I watched all of my girlfriends obsess over Edward versus Jacob for my entire high school career. <laughs> and I was just over it, <laughs> you yeah. know. And so phased was kind of my originally written to kind of be my rebuttal to, well, I just want to write a book about cool werewolves and it's going to be a YA and a paranormal, but it's not it doesn't fit in that label box. Um, and that has actually made it harder to market the book because I have to say there's werewolves in it and I have to say it's YA because it is both of those things, but there's a stereotype that comes along with that label. Mm. Um. <laughs> well, we have both sides represented. I'm team, <laughs> I chat. was team Edward and for the record. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. That explains so many. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was interesting, though, because I do think that sometimes the the labels can actually be a deterrent because they do start to have stereotypes because there's a general vibe to to each one. Absolutely. Um, That's really challenging. It, it has really been. Challenging. Yeah, it has yeah. been. Um, so yeah, this... non-romantic paranormal YA story. Right. There is a romantic <laughs> subplot. It is oh. not toxic or oh, okay. like... And it's not the point of the story. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's much, it's, it's dealing with much heavier, like mental health themes typically is the, is how I um, recommend it to people because that was really the point. It's a, it's a story about PTSD really. Ah, okay. um, fantastic. So yeah. yeah. That's really <laughs> important too for a YA audience to get themes like that too. So. Right. Yeah. I agree. And that was partially why I wrote it because I, I wanted to be able to, offer, you know, a different type of story to that particular label. Um, <laughs> you know, some, we get into some weird stuff on this channel, Zen. <laughs> um, yes, yes, there, I, I'm a huge X-Men fan. So yes, love that. It's, I think the newer um, kind of bleeds into like you could argue it's YA like first class is very YA um from a film standpoint I'm going just based on the films just before <laughs> anybody gets confused but um yeah I think some of the older ones were definitely more on the adult end of things but yeah it's kind of in the gray area between I think um but yeah so kind of to wrap up um why I think the question that I wanted us to kind of end on is why we still love epic fantasy and, you know, what we're excited to see more of from that particular, is it a subgenre at this point? Probably a subgenre. Yeah. We'll just say it's a subgenre. Yeah. Right. Especially, right. I, I especially really liked what Jenny pointed out about like almost the whole entire, I can't remember exactly how she articulated it, but the whole entire culture or world or society like fabric of society mm -hmm. re, like changing and transforming into something new or different like that to me 
ah, that's so powerful. That's, yeah. that's what excites me about epic fantasy is like this idea of just this enormous grand scale change mm -hmm. or something yeah. about that. Yeah. I love seeing the ripple effects in all of my favorite stories. I love seeing how the choices of a single character or a group of characters affects this massive kind of national or global scale time in history. I love seeing like, and, and, you know, we talk about everything from Malazan where you see the after effects of, of thousands and thousands of years of history um, and how it's affected the present and the character choices um, all the way back to like, you know, again, the stories like We Are the Dead, where it's eight days <laughs> in the first book and how those those because I think it's it's very easy for us to feel very small in a very large universe, <laughs> at least it is for me. And knowing that the decisions we make for good or evil do have an effect. And I think that's a really important moral theme for us to grapple with on a regular basis. So absolutely. I think that's my favorite thing about epic fantasy is the the sway between micro and macro. Yeah. So you have the macro, the large scale scale things that are happening and the consequences for everyone. And at the mm -hmm. same time, every individual part, every micro part matters. Every right. part is yep. meaningful. And I cannot wait now for you to finish Malazan Book of the Fallen. <laughs> <Why don't> we... <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It'll happen someday and there's no rush it's or pressure. Happen. But yeah. but there's no feeling in, to yeah. me. There's no feeling I've ever had with the story like the feeling I had after I finished book 10 in that series. There's nothing like it. I I felt it for over a year. <laughs> I was mm -hmm. emotional I about the end of that series. So it, it is, there's something just incredibly rewarding, almost like getting to the top of a very, very, very high mountain. And ev every step on that mountain was worth it. Mm -hmm. And you see it all come together at the end. And the view from the top is just, there's nothing like it. There is nothing like it when it comes to a, a series of that scope. Yeah. I mean, I, that, that's such an amazing feeling. I think when you've committed to a story of that magnitude and you get to the end and you have the full scope of it in your mind and all of the things that you've experienced with the characters over that amount of whatever amount of time it is, that's something that changes you, I think, on a fundamental level as a person um, in, in your own experience in reality. And that's a really powerful, beautiful thing about storytelling that makes me excited to be an, to be a writer because I, I recognize the power that we have to reach across so many different lines um, with the stories that we tell and impact people that we will never meet, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So. And I'm all the more excited, by the way, Tori, to read your series, to read <laughs> The Bloodstones. I've heard such fantastic things about it. And I know people in the chat will agree. So if you haven't picked up The Bloodstones, now's your chance. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> I'm sure you. there's a link in the description. <laughs> there is, yes. <laughs> um, also, I appreciate, Daniel, your comment um, that phase that is I should use that more because you're right. Phase does have very strong X-Men vibes. Um, and I think I need to work that into the marketing more because I think that would kind of shove it toward its more intended audience better. Mm -hmm. um, it's always such a hard thing to figure out how to word your sales pitches. <laughs> so, um Let's see. Cassidy kind of has a point that goes along with what we were talking about earlier. I think Epic will come back more as we remove ourselves from COVID where we needed things to be small and cozy because outside was scary. Yeah. Yeah. I need things to be cozy sometimes too. So I, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm on not very often, that. but sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. Sometimes not very often, but there's a place for it. Yeah. Um. Let's see, Corey, to me, epic fantasy will always be large scale. The world, the depth, change, and shift of characters over the story. It's an expanse while looking closely at a set of characters. Yeah. 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 So again, that micro, macro and micro progression. Mm -hmm. Love that. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah. So for anybody who's interested, yes, there is a link to the Bloodstones down in the um, 
description box below. And it uh, is the first in a trilogy that will eventually expand into multiple series. So um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of playing both sides of the fence <laughs> there a little yeah. bit. I've like, I got a trilogy, but also there's going to be a subsequent series that ties in. Um, so yeah, I am working on book two currently and having a good time with it. So um, but Joanna, thank you so much for joining me. And I, I love being able to deep dive and uh, you are always an excellent partner for that <laughs> deep dive conversation evening. So thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you, Tori. It was my pleasure. And this was just so much fun. And thank you to everyone in the chat. It's just yeah. so fun to be able to talk about this subgenre we all love together. Yeah, I agree. And for everybody in the chat too, thank you for sharing your thoughts and definitions. And one of the things that I love about this is as somebody who really, really cares about epic fantasy as a genre, both as a reader and a writer, um, it makes me very happy. Like Joanna was saying earlier, it just make, it makes me feel so warm inside to see everyone so passionate about not just epic fantasy, but fantasy in general. And I love that we all have such a passion for it. That's something that I really appreciate about this community. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys all have some five-star reads coming your way and have a great week. And we will see you in the next video. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good night.